Our final module on mites will include the large family, the Areophyidae. These are highly modified arachnids. They are extremely small, usually one-tenth to one millimeter in length. They also have elongate bodies that are generally carrot or cigar shaped, with the front of the body having two pairs of forward projecting legs. The hind legs have been lost. Most species have the back part of the body annulated. That is, the exoskeleton looks like it is made up of many tiny rings. Areophyid mites are also called rust mites or gall mites. Despite their small size, the surface feeding mites can extract sufficient cell contents to turn host foliage yellow then a rusty brown color. Others use chemicals to force plant tissues to make unusual growths in which the mites feed and are protected from predators. Galls. Areophyid mites have only four stages. All lay eggs that are generally tiny spheres. The first instar nymph is called a larva or protonymph by Areophyid experts. These look like a tiny version of the adults and protonymphs have two pairs of forward projecting legs. After feeding, the protonymph remains quiescent while undergoing the molting process. The second instar nymph is usually called a deutonymph by experts. This stage feeds, becomes quiescent, and molts into the adult. Males are generally smaller than females. Like many other mites, once mated, females can produce eggs that will hatch into males or females. However, unmated females can only produce male eggs. While this life cycle looks pretty straightforward, many areified mites have two forms of females, a summer active form and a overwintering form that is usually a bit larger and has thicker exoskeleton. Summer females are called protogynes and overwintering females are called deutogynes. The hemlock rust mite is a rather classic rust mite species. This one overwinters as eggs attached to the bases of hemlock needles. In very early spring, when star magnolia begins to bloom, the eggs hatch and the areophyids first feed on the undersurfaces of the needles. These develop rather rapidly, taking only a week to 10 days to go through the protonymph and deutonymph stages. As populations increase, the mites will eventually cover both upper and lower surfaces. By the time new shoots finish elongation and the new needles harden off, the mites will move to these areas. This mite doesn't seem to do well in hot weather, so females lay eggs that may remain dormant until the next spring. In cooler climates, some adult females can overwinter in bark crevices or small branches. The rose rosette mite is likely the most important rust mite that occurs in urban landscapes, now that knockout roses are being used so extensively. This mite transmits a virus disease that causes infected roses to produce greatly distorted stems and leaves. Leaves are often dwarfed, stems have increased thorns, and growth is often a distinctive red color, though some roses produce bushy green growth. The dwarfing and bushy growth is called witch's brooming. Once a rose has been infected, the only treatment is rapid removal with detail paid to get the entire root system out. Due to giants overwinter in crevices of the bark and begin feeding and egg laying when new shoots elongate. These females average one egg per day for a 30-day period. The eggs take two to three days to hatch, and the nymphs take four to five days to reach adulthood. This continues all summer, but damage from the mite feeding is rarely noticed. When cool weather arrives, the protogyne females produce deutogyne females that take in spermatophores located on leaf surfaces by males. These then overwinter. This mite often pricks up the virus disease when feeding on wild multiflora rose. The mites easily balloon to new plants where they can infect them. Rosarians know to quickly remove infected plants as the mites can more easily balloon to nearby plants. The spruce rust mite is like the spruce spider mite in being a cool season species. It overwinters and oversummers as dormant eggs usually attached to the bases of needles. 
Overwintered eggs hatch as early as March, and the mites may undergo several generations before stopping their activity in June. They pick up activity again in late September and early October, then cease activity by the end of November into mid-December. Their feeding causes general bronzing of the foliage, but inspection of needles with a hand lens will reveal that the bronzing speckles are smaller than those produced by the spruce spider mites. This mite is very common on dwarf Alberta spruces, and the interaction of this mite with spruce spider mites can cause needle drop and even branch death on these trees. By the time that this damage is noticed in the summer, both mites have ceased activity. Bald cypress is increasingly used in urban landscapes, especially where soils are becoming saturated for part of the season. It is a very hardy deciduous conifer that can survive hot and dry periods in the summer. However, it has a rust mite that can turn the foliage a reddish brown by midsummer that then results in early needle drop. This species overwinters as dudogynes hiding under flaps of bark. In the spring, these move to the newly expanding needles and begin to lay eggs for the protogyne generations. The mite can completely cover both upper and lower needle surfaces, and their white cast skins are easily seen with a hand lens. Reproduction speeds up with warm weather, and by August, needles can turn brown and drop. Bald cypress trees can be sensitive to horticultural oils, so other pesticides registered for rust mite control should be used. Thorough coverage of the foliage is needed to achieve control, and early treatments in late May into mid-June are recommended to prevent significant damage. The paraleaf blister mite is an important pest of fruit orchards, but it can also damage ornamental calorie pears. In orchards, the mites can damage the fruit, but in landscapes, the damage is primarily the blisters that form on leaves. This mite overwinters as deutogynes that are located at the bases of buds or within the bud scales. In early spring, these females lay eggs within the leaf bud scales. The hatching protogynes cause a proliferation of cells on the expanding leaf surfaces. Some of these cells die, which forms a cavity in which the mites can feed on soft tissues and continue their reproduction. These eventually are the blisters that are located on the leaves. Susceptible cultivars can have most of the leaves curled and distorted by midsummer. When a blister becomes crowded, the mites will depart and can form new blisters. When they feed on developing fruit, this causes a rough surface called russet. This mite can be especially troublesome to control because the deutogynes and protogynes are not normally exposed. In recent years, coneflowers have begun to display flowers that are nothing but a ball of spiky petals and flower parts. In the past, this was associated with a virus disease, but this new malady seems to be associated with an areophyid mite that is now commonly called the coneflower flower gall mite. It appears that the deutogynes overwinter on the old stems of echinacea plants. As new growth begins in the spring, these mites move to the flower buds. Their feeding causes a proliferation of short flower petals across the cone. Some flowers only have the top of the flower cone affected, and other flowers can have the entire flower cone affected. The mites rapidly develop and reproduce during the summer months, and when the flower cone becomes crowded, the mites will emerge to balloon to other flowers and plants. Most coneflower growers have learned that cutting plants to the ground and removing all leaf and stem debris in the fall can help manage this pest. Once damage appears in the flowers, this mite is nearly impossible to control with pesticides. Another type of leaf tissue proliferation caused by areophyte mites is called leaf erinium. Erinium appears as velvety patches on leaves, usually on leaf undersurfaces, but erinium can also occur on upper leaf surfaces. These are often called velvet galls or felt galls. Maples, especially sugar and Norway maples, can be infested with erinium mites. 
The crimson aridiumite on sugar maple is well named as it forms bright pink felty patches on leaves in the spring. Other species produce yellow or green iridium patches on the undersides of leaves. Most of these species overwinter as deutogynes hiding at the bases of leaf buds or in crevices of bark. These move on to expanding leaves in the spring and produce the protogynes that cause the iridium patches to form. Control is not recommended as little damage is done to the health of infested trees. The beech iridium mite is very similar to the maple iridium mites. Depending on the beech tree genetics, some iridium patches caused by this mite can be bright yellow to orange in color while others remain green. Again, little long-term damage is caused to the health of infested plants. Depending on the environmental conditions, this mite can cause extensive leaf damage, but in following seasons, few iridium patches may be formed. Many areified mites are true gall formers. There are generally two types of leaf galls made by areophyids, bladder galls and spindle galls. On silver and red maples, one areified mite species forms bladder galls. This mite overwinters as deutogynes located under bark flaps or at the bases of leaf buds. When new leaves emerge in the spring, these females move to the leaf undersurfaces and their feeding causes a proliferation of cells to form a tiny bladder that rises on the upper leaf surface. The mites enter the opening from the underside of the leaf and soon lay eggs that will form the protogynes. These continue reproduction until July into August when the bladder tissues dry out and new deutogynes emerge to seek hiding places until the next season. While alarming to tree owners, these maple bladder galls do little harm to the trees. The maple spindle gall mite only attacks sugar maple. It has a life cycle nearly identical to the maple bladder gall mite, except that the galls appear as rounded spikes on the leaf surfaces, not bladders. The protogynes reproduce within these spindle galls until July and August when deutogynes are produced which emerge when the galls split open. The privet rust mite is another classic surface feeding areophyid mite. It is often missed or its damage is mistaken for privet mite or privet thrips activity. Infested plants generally display yellowing or bronzing of the foliage. The deutogynes overwinter located on the bark of shrubs. In the spring, these move to the new foliage where they lay eggs for the summer protogyne generations. Continual reproduction can occur for the summer, especially if cool conditions persist. The mites feed on the upper and lower leaf surfaces and extensive feeding can cause early leaf drop. Almost every landscape plant has one or more areophyid mites that can live on it. Some cause foliar damage and many also cause abnormal growths or galls. Many species apparently feed on surface fungi and pollen grains and these are considered to be vagrant species and are of little importance. The ash flower gall mite is a important species that forces ash flowers to form a contorted mass of tissues that results in no seeds being formed. The white pine rust mite often causes blanching of white pine needles in the fall and spring. Another bladder gall maker is the linden bladder gall mite. The willow leaf gall mite is another areophyte that can contort emerging willow leaves. All of these mites can cause very noticeable damage to their host plants, but these rarely cause long-term health risks to their hosts. There are only a few fault spider mites that infest landscape plants. These mites are in the family Tenupalpidae. A couple of species occur on conifers, and the privet mite is the most common species found in deciduous landscape plants. However, the most common fault spider mite is found on Phalaenopsis orchids. It is simply known as the Phalaenopsis mite. This mite is very flat and has legs that appear to be attached to the side of the body. These mites cause the formation of pits on leaf surfaces. 
Extensive feeding causes Phalaenopsis orchid leaves to have a rough surface and the leaves will turn yellow and die earlier than normal. This mite has a life cycle similar to spider mites. Females lay eggs which take about three weeks to hatch into the six-legged larvae. The larva molts into the six-legged protonymph in about two weeks. The protonymph and deutonymph take another two weeks each to develop before adult males and females appear. Reproduction is continuous throughout the year, but development is slowed during cool weather. Mites in the family Tarsonimidae are extremely small, and two important species regularly infest household plants the cyclamen mite and the broad mite. Both mites can also end up in the landscape where certain greenhouse grown bedding plants and perennials are put into the landscape. The cyclamen mite commonly attacks begonia, chrysanthemums, gerba, geranium, fuchsia, larkspur, petunia, snapdragon, and African violets in the greenhouse. And infested plants can then end up in the landscape. These tiny mites feed primarily on the new growth and their damage can result in withering of this growth. Damage often looks like botrytis fungal infection. Females lay one to three eggs per day, but only 12 to 16 eggs total. However, the immature stages can complete their development in one to three weeks, depending on the temperature. Since damage is most extensive on soft expanding tissues, Young plants in the greenhouse are especially vulnerable to this mite. Since it isn't a spider mite, not all miticides work against this mite. For landscapes, avoid using any plants that are exhibiting slow new growth. The broad mite is the second most common tarsinomenid mite that is found in greenhouse plants and some greenhouse produce landscape flowers. Ageretum, begonia, chrysanthemum, dahlia, gerbia, gloxina, impatiens, lantana, marigold, snapdragons, verbena, and zinnia are common host plants. Like the cyclamen mite, this one attacks newly expanding foliage that can result in the new growth looking like it is being attacked by botrytis fungus. Adult broad mites appear as smooth oval mites. This mite also has continuous reproduction in the greenhouse and it is unusual in having only one nymphal form. Thus, it has eggs, six-legged larvae, eight-legged nymph, and then adult males and females. This mite has a higher reproductive capacity and immature development generally takes eight to ten days to complete. Its small size makes it very difficult to reach with most miticides.